All right. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. So, first of all, I'm terrified, but it's going to be fine, I'm sure. <laughs> So, welcome to this talk called Barry 3D, the animation of Noara. Um, I'm Pierrick Picot. I'm uh, the art director at Atypic Studio, the studio working on the game Noara. And I'm also the lead rigger and animator because it's a small studio, so you tend to do everything on your own. It's not the case, but I do most of the animations. I'm also... Uh, Blender content creator. I do educational content under the name P2 Design. And I released um, some courses, including the Art of Effective Rigging and the Alive course. Um, so if you, don't buy, uh, if you don't have it, just buy tons of copies so that I can get rich. And that's cool. <laughs> so what is this talk about? It's about the animation of Noara, but it's uh, mostly about how we try to break the boundaries of uh, animation for games and gameplay animation. So we'll go through this, and uh, I'll start by talking about how animators tend or try to trick their audience. Um, we'll go through some game animation constraints, because there are constraints how we apply the principle of animation, like the pace principle of animation, to improve those game animations, and how we try to push our style further or those principles further to, uh, let's say, improve those animations. And we'll get a little nerdy at the end of the talk, nothing crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, let's get started. So, Noara is a turn-based game, but the big twist and hopefully the thing that will, me will make it stand out is that you, you can play during your opening turns. So it has some real-time features and it's pretty high-paced. So that's the, the cool thing about it. It's a character-based game, that's why we have a lot of characters, uh, where you have to kill and conquer so war never gets old when it comes to game design, so we're just sticking to that. Uh, we've been working on this for five years, and I've been there for five years too, and we do hold the rigging and animation in Blender, but we also do a lot of modeling, UVs, environment and stuff like that, all of our cinematics uh, in Blender. So, we are mostly all here because we do love 3D. Some of you may prefer grease pencil and 2D, but that's perfectly fine. But most of what we see is, is seen through a 2D screen. So in the end, it's flat. It's not 3D. The, the word 3D doesn't really exist in what we are seeing right now, uh, especially there, OK? Or it's printed on canvas or whatnot. So at some point, you can use like VR or stuff like that to really see stuff in 3D in a way, but most of the time it's 2D. Um, so when it comes to cinematics, whether you're using 2D or 3D as a tool, the outcome is 2D, okay? So this allows the, the animator to trick their audience or at least to guide the eyes of the audience through composition, whether it's using the character pose or other stuff to lead you to a point of interest in the whole frame. Um, you can use VFX, you can use camera motion, you can use focal lengths, you can use environments to work on the composition. So here you can see a comparison between uh, what you would actually see on the cinematics and how it's made in 3D. So it's super different in the end what is 3D and what you currently see. You can also use uh, posing, you know, to like trick your audience. So from this point of view, this pose, I would say, look pretty nice. But if I just show you the true pose, it's a little weird, you know. But it does look good from the point of view I give you and not from the 3D point of view. But it does also look nice, you know, I know. <laughs> So in most games, you can control the camera, or at least um, you barely control the camera yourself, and the player will be controlling the camera. So it's harder to use composition or to trick your audience this way, because you never know what the player is going to be looking at, unless 
it's a game with a lot of camera control. In Aura, most of the game or the, the main view is a top-down view, but you can still pan, rotate, you can zoom in, it will change the camera angle. And so we try to make first the animation to look straight from this angle, but it can change. And I don't want my animation to look bad from any other angle. So that's a first step. Um, it's a character-based game, okay? So we have character animation set. Generally, those are like a state animation, like idle, being stunned, being dead, or locomotion, running, jumping, and skill animation, okay? Um, when it comes to locomotion, that's not super complicated, I would say. And um, most of the time, locomotion is, is the very first animation we do for our characters, because it's a good way to uh, bring a bit of personality to the character, or at least try to frame this. And it's not technically complicated. You just try to match the ground speed, and whatever touch the ground, you set it to linear interpolation, and you're more or less done. So you just try to make it look good and fit those requirements. But when it comes to skills or animation that have a purpose for gameplay, uh, like this throwing animation, the game designer will say, okay, you have like a third of a second to release uh, whatever we are throwing or whatever skill is happening on the screen. So as an animator, that sucks. You know, you want to have as many frames as you want to make it look good. But as a gameplay animator, you have to fit those requirements because gameplay is the most important thing. And you may have played like not super good looking games, but that were just fun. And it's not because of the animation, it's because the, the game is fun. So that's the main thing. So this happened also for attack animation, for example, where they will again say, say me, you have a third of a second to hit the target. But then I have a bit of freedom on the recover and the settle. When the action is done, since it's a turn-based game, we can like make a bit longer animation and have this kind of freedom. For a combo, same issue uh, or same constraint. I need to hit every five frame from frame 15, for example. So with this character that has very long tentacles and limbs, how do you get to properly read this animation or make it appealing in a way? So that's pretty, yeah pretty good constraint in the end. So to tackle that, we use the principle of animation. So there might be some, you know, some, some principles that will stick to st cinematics or games that are, but most of the time those are exactly the same. So our animation needs to be fast so that you have a feel of responsiveness whenever you're clicking on the target and you want hit to suffer from an attack, you don't want to wait for it. So depending on the strength that the character will put in the attack or the damage output, the animation might be a little slower or a little longer than uh, just a, a fast light attack, for example. To make those animations as appealing and as readable as possible, we rely as much as possible on anticipation. The problem is that we have like very few frames to anticipate our motion because it's gameplay animation. So you do need strong poses. For example, here on the anticipation poses, the character is getting like really, really low to raise his big hammer. And then I would hold the next kind of anticipation where he's about to slam the hammer on the ground, so that you clearly understand that he's raising something heavy. So next move won't be good for the guy in front of it, okay? And to bring even more impact or whatever, I often use micro-anticipation. So basically you take the last pose or the last couple of frames before the hit or before the release, and you just extremely push the pose. So when you, you see it real time on the top left corner, you, you just feel it. Like you just see this, this kind of extension, this kind of you know, trigger in the, in the shot. 
Um, so you, you don't really see it, but it does bring a little more, a little something else to the animation, I would say. So that's the, the first very important thing is make sure that you understand the base motion and what's going to happen. Then there is directionality. That's super important in a game where you can move in every direction to understand what's the orientation of the character, what is he doing, and in which direction. So we try to design our poses so that every part of the character or every features point in the same direction. So that whatever the point of view, it will work. Okay? So that's yeah, what I try to, to show here. Hopefully it's pretty obvious. What you shouldn't do, so those are animation, like on the right it should be like the third animation I did for the game. I did some progress, hopefully it shows. <laughs> um, I was, so I, I had no experience in game animation. So a character is dying, I was doing like a death animation, like super dramatic animation. So you may understand that those people are dying, but in the game context where you see those animations from afar, it doesn't work at all. That's super boring to see. So now when I tackle death animation, I use like way more dynamic animation with um, more impact for sure, broader motion. Uh, and it's like super snappy. The first frame is that you're dead. So that when it comes to the gameplay situation, it's satisfying to um, kill someone. Just <laughs> don't get this out of the context, please. <laughs> and sue me or whatever. So yeah, well, when, when the, the character is receiving the, the fatal blow, there is no like doubt that it was a pretty hardcore for him. And it feels good, you know? It, it will push you to to attack, why it might not be the best move in the game, you know, but, you know, aggressivity is yeah, part of human nature, I guess. So that's the, I would say, the, the, fundam the, the, the base principle of animation applied to game. And now our philosophy, I would say, pretentiously, um, is to try to, to make it look 2D, to push the animation further and try to forget about 3D. Uh, um, and just yeah, make it look good in a way. So um, the most important thing as first is the silhouette of your character when you're working, I mean, even in 2D, you, you watch any talk about 2D animation, about posing, about anything, silhouette is the key thing about good animation. But in the 3D context is, <laughs> will my silhouette look good from back, top view, side view, etc. So what I generally try to do is to align the silhouette of the character with the motion path. So that whatever the point of view, it will feel good. You will have again this directionality. And this directionality will, will come many, many times in what I'm going to show you in, in our animation design. I made a custom workspace with just you know, an additional workspace with a few camera angles where I can double check the animation. I'm, I'm just switching. And mostly it helps me um, spotting any, any glitches. Sometimes you forget about maybe a hand that just pop and you don't see it because you're animating from the side view or front view. And on the top view it might just appear and, and whatnot. So that's a way to check this. And to build like this flow in the motion and in the silhouette of the character, I do rely a lot on uh, Blender's uh, motion path. So it's one of my quick favorites. I use it all the time. And you can see here that the torso root of the character, the main core of the character, it, its center of gravity is following uh, the bounce we saw just before. And his silhouette does also follow this motion path. And then I use quite a lot of space switching to unbind some of the bones from the character to be able to animate them in world space. So basically here I'm just animating some bouncing ball that goes in a random position. I don't even care about the character at this point. I don't care about those elements. It just brings a bit of chaos into the animation. So you can clearly see the, the the base animation, but those add some extra details. 
So it's end key. We don't use like most of the time we don't use FXs to do this kind of stuff. And then it's baked back to the base animation. So I talked about uh, silhouettes and motion flow. So and directionality. So the idea on most move is to identify a simple shape that will fit. So here it's a spinning attack. So a circle would be like the most obvious shape you will try to fit. So whatever the point of view, I don't offer that many point of view here, but trust me, the, the tentacles are perfectly aligned along uh, this circle. It was a pain because I had to totally reverse the torso chain through space switching uh, so that it was driven by <coughs> the contacting foot. And then you, you can see that the spine is not changing angle throughout the animation so that the, um, uh, the tentacles are not wobbling from frame to frame. And it looks, I would say, pretty cool. And then on top of this, when uh, our VFX artist is like, so what, what kind of VFX should I add on top of it? Do a circle so that you, you're just supporting the current animation and the current motion. And it makes kind of sense. We use squash and stretch to an extreme. So we, you, you may know squash and stretch because it's one of the first principles you may apply and you may learn when you're starting animation. Here it's an octopus character with blades, so it's a pretty busy shape. But by using like super simple squash and stretch principle, we make the animation a little more readable. And again, it gives directionality to the jump. So beyond the the fact that it could be appealing, etc., you do understand that she's going to jump, she's jumping, and then she's just landing. You will find this squash and stretch principle in most of the animation we do, because it allows to have a good anticipation, which was one of the first points I, I kind of point, <laughs> pointed out. Um, and when you add this question stretch effect to different parts of the body, uh, it becomes very organic, you know, it, it becomes like super fleshy. And again, we have a good sense of directionality. You do understand, even though the character, fat characters are pretty hard to animate because it's hard to give a ball uh, an orientation. So I stretch the limbs so that you clearly understand where, where he's attacking. Okay, so that's one of the moves. Finally, we use a lot of stretching toward the target. So you've seen that I use stretching to give a directionality for an attack, for example, but I may also stretch my character toward the landing point so that it makes no doubt where the character is about to land. And also, it generally contrasts a lot with the next pose, which is a, a recover pose or, or follow-through pose where the character is squashed. So it should be appealing and like convincing. So one of the big problem with game animation and this fast motion, even though the example you, you saw were like um, slow down or breakdown, so it was readable. But when it's in the game context, it, it's like super fast. You're not like focusing on the character that is currently attacking because you may play six characters at the same time. So. So it tends to break readability. So how can we fix fast motion uh, readability? How can we improve that? In cinematics, so I took this. I, I don't know where it comes from, but uh, I, I find it uh, pre pretty, pretty nice, I must say. Uh, we use like what we call smears. So there are a lot of different kinds of smears. But um, basically, so I will just pause because I feel like it's not super readable when I do it this way, if I can. But basically, if you see the, the real-time motion first there, like, you just felt that she was stopping. But now, if you watch it frame by frame, some of the frames are just, like, uh, crazy deformed. I don't know if, if you got it, but I do believe you got it. So, I would advise you to watch Fright Sprites frame by frame, it's crazy good. 
so you have this kind of deformation, which are um, uh, what we call smears. So basically, you, you kind of stretch uh, your, your character, you deform it to mimic motion blur. Basically, that's the ID. Then there are multiples, so I don't know if I will be able to stop on the frame, but if you see the wooden bat there, like we can see um, like multiple duplicate of the wooden bait. So even though the character is switching from this pose to this pose, you kind of see the motion flow, okay? Another type of smear, which is a little more like not, uh, how to say, not, it's pretty common, but it, it might be a little harder to think about are those broken joints where the limbs become like super like noodles and stuff like that. So it's like whips and we'll, we'll see that a little later on. So in cinematics, since you're just like um, focusing on what will be seen through the 2D screen and through the framing that you choose, you can easily do that. And I do believe that if we were to watch those scenes from another angle, that there probably are some very dirty, uh, you know, poses or crazy poses that are involved to get this nice result on screen. Um, you can do these kind of things too into the games because it's gonna be flat. So this is a an example I came across it on Twitter. This is a team I'm following, Team 18K. They are doing this game Shattered. They have one animator working on the project. He does crazy animation. When you see those smears, I asked him, how do you design that? And oh, I'm just transitioning from one frame to the other. Yeah, okay, but how do you, <laughs> yeah, how do you came across those shapes? I mean, this one, that's, well, that's crazy. And when it's playing in real time, now you know they are smears, so you, you, you may spot them, but honestly, you, you just feel like it's super smooth and it makes you like, like it's so cool. But how would you do that in 3D, in, in a 3D game? That's a little harder to, to achieve. So in Noara, one of our philosophy, or I mean, we are not like doing groundbreaking stuff, but we're just trying to push the deformation as far as possible to, to match this kind of stuff. Uh, so we're trying to create smears, but in the context of animation that can be seen from any angles, and this is where it becomes a little tricky. Sometimes it can be pretty subtle, so on the left, the blades are curving. So it just supports the flow of the tentacles, okay? And it adds some femininity, I don't know if you would, it looks more feminine, which she's the queen, like she's super, like, uh, f super feminine. On the right, that's still fine, but it kind of blinks a bit, you know, you, you, you have a, a little harder time to track the blades. So, not like a big improvement, but still a little improvement. On other animation, though, this one is by Adam War, he's one of our animators, a young guy, like he's, he's a killer and such a nice dude, so it's a pleasure to work with him. That being said, we, we do use those smears, and we also do use exaggeration, so the character is beating uh, his uh, opponent to two, and when he does that, he hit part of it and um, cure himself in a way. So we do need the viewer to understand the move, at least we, we are trying to do so. So when you see it like frame by frame on the right, you, you can really see how we change totally the size and shape of the head, so that on the left, you just get this beating motion at some point, you, you feel like, yeah, a mouth is opening and, 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 and kind of, you know, closing onto the target. So how do we create those meals? Like, what's the, the, the workflow in a way? I mainly use stretching toward the previous frame to create a trail effect. So as you do with the add-on, in a way, that's the same philosophy. And I do, and, and I use a lot of crazy bending to create a whipping motion for the limbs, the body, whatever. So that's not what I'm going to say is not our, like, I don't always do that this way, but generally we do the base motion and we create the smears like almost frame by frame uh, during the polishing stage. 
So I would have my base motion and from there I would work on the smear. So how would I push this motion further or this animation further to get a nice result? So this is where I just need to up, relaunch the thing. Okay. So th this is Shaksa, she's a, a, a warrior character in the game. And our main uh, skill is a range attack animation where she throws a couple of big boomerangs. Here they are. So this is where I use the, the whip motion or the, the noodle limbs. So you can see on the very left, the very anticipation pose. And then when she's throwing the, the boomerangs, how I break the joints of her limbs and I also add more kind of joints to the limbs to create a shape that more look like a whip than a current limb. And I'm also deforming those crystal boomerang that should not deform just to support this shape. And then you have like almost the opposite shape like a couple of frames later so that you really have this, this whipping motion that you would see like if you would watch Indiana Jones. So in the end, from the top view or from the, the game point of view, you almost can't see that. But maybe you can feel it and it will look a little better. And then, as I explained before, she, we will stretch our limbs toward the, the, the landing uh, target in a way. So that you understand like she, she's in the air, she's doing her stuff and where she's going to land. So if you have to click the, uh, I don't know, the, the square space where she's going to be to control her, that you, you already know where it is. So that's, yeah, that should help you get that right, <laughs> in a way. Um, this is Moxie. She's one of the latest characters I worked on. She's, she's like super grumpy. Uh, she was actually inspired by the grandmother of one of my colleagues. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I, I, and he's really happy about the results of that. That's, that's cool. <laughs> so I want to show you when she the, her hit animation. So when basically a character is receiving damages, you know, you, you, you just hit it. We will play this hit animation, and I really wanted to to push the this animation as far as possible so that we totally forget it's made with 3D or whatever and it is as appealing as possible. And the design is simply a heat shape. That's, I mean, yeah, obvious now, but yeah, that, that was the idea. So I just stretched the limbs to create some kind of star shape. It may not read as well from a pure side point of view. We can't fix everything for sure, but still it does look pretty neat, I guess. And since she's bold and she doesn't want people to see that, this was a good opportunity to like, bring more personality to the, to the character and also more deformation or appeal just in the motion where you can see her like she's recovering and she's like, oh, I need to get my hat back on my head. And she's just like stretching her limbs to get it back on her head, basically. So, hopefully this kind of breaks the usual stiffness that we do see in, in most games. I, I mean, there are like games that really goes way beyond what we're doing there, but I'm trying to catch up, basically. <laughs> so, um, here I'm applying so the, the, the smears, or I'm trying to, to create smears using her face, using the cloth, and using her fingers. And the way we do design our smears, so when you are doing it on screen, you're just taking point A, point B, and you're trying to make the link, favorizing point A or point B, so that you, you get the arcs of motion. We just do exactly the same. I would use the motion path or whatever tool I have to track the hands, and then I will shape the fingers and the cloth along the, this path. So it, I do believe pretentiously that it does look cool from the front view, but also from the top view. You, you clearly identify the rotation of the character. Uh, when she will be spinning just now, you will see the circle, whatever the point of view you, you're, you're watching the animation from. So you do understand, even though that's a super fast animation, that she's rotating to, to throw those needles. 
This is the King Akuyandi. So he's the king of uh, the, the main character at the moment in the game. You really don't want to mess with that guy. He's pretty big. And this is him, his main attack animation you already uh, saw before. So what I want to show you here is that if we want, we can break physics. We don't care. So even though his hammer is made of stone and glass, I will make a smear out of it. You know, I will stretch it just that you can clearly read the arc of motion before it touched the ground. And I'm squashing it and making it like a bit bouncy to, to bring more impact to the animation. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the idea. So let's get techie. I guess some of you will be really, really disappointed about what you're going to see because it's absolutely not <laughs> technical at all. We're using the game engine Unity to do our game and our animation state machine is like the most like basic stuff you could do. We don't use um, blending of different parts of the body, we don't use body mask, we don't blend different anim states. Basically, we're dealing with our animation as you would do in uh, an image sequencer, if you will. And we are just triggering like the attack animation, it ends, it goes back to the idle pose and the idle animation will start. That's the way we'll deal with our animation. The cool thing about that is that we can use flat hierarchy. So basically, this is the deformation rig, the one that is in the game engine. You don't export your control rig. This is, yeah, all the animation is baked on that. And even though you are seeing some chains, like on the boomerangs, on the limbs, or whatever, those bones are not parenting one to the other. They are just doing their stuff like independently. So the cool stuff about that is that we can use non-uniform scaling, which is a big problem with game engines. Game engines don't like that. If we want, we can stretch a bone, for example, it won't affect the children because there is no children in the end. The problem with that technique, you could use it, but if you want to transition from between two animations that are very contrasted in the pose, it's a bit like trying to achieve a rotation with a shape key. It's impossible because they are just moving like in a linear fashion, you know, they are not rotating. It's the same here. You can see the bones going from point A to B independently. So the character bodies, the boomerang are just like getting totally like wrecked or whatever, and then she will recover. But we don't do this kind of transition. We generally have an animation that does the transition. So we do have transition for sure in the game, but they are like super min min minimalistic. So you, you won't notice that it's bugging or, or whatever. We do have a lot of bones on our characters, but we don't use like super complicated mechanism. Uh, we do have a lot of bones because as you saw, we like to deform our character to an extreme and there is no like magic beyond that. You just need to have a lot of control points to do that. Um, all of our rig are custom made uh, because first we have a lot of creature and like strange looking characters. So it's hard to find an automated solution. And also it's a way to learn rigging and to improve rigging when you are pretending to teach people how to rig that's good thing to do and it allows us to have a nice range of motion also if there's a bug i know where's the bug is for example so i don't need to go through a rig i haven't built myself for example um so those yeah rigs we, we had some controllers to like get shapes or deformation that you know would fit the animation that we have planned um, we are also allowed to, as you, you, you see before, to deform any art surfaces or stuff that shouldn't deform. And we have a bit of facial animation. So it may not make sense in a top-down game point of view, especially on some kind of MOBA, uh, because most of the time you won't be seeing the face. But now just think about marketing stuff. We do use the same character for our cinematics. We don't have like tons of different characters. So if you came across some of our cinematic content, it was made with the game characters basically. 
And if you were to pay for a free for a free game, sorry, you would buy skins and stuff like that. So you want to be attached to those characters. So we need to bring personality uh, to them, and we can do it through those facial animation. Um, also, those are like, cool Easter eggs, especially when he's getting drunk, when he's drinking like that. He has a hat, so you will hardly see this, you know. But it's there. <laughs> Um, for our facial animation, so they are not as polished as the, the one we will do with cinematics. So we rely a lot on the action constraint and the action man, um, um, action man add-on currently. Uh, I need to talk to Demeter or test his add-on because he did an, an improved version of it, so it must be like super cool. So basically you just pose the face of your character uh, and then using all the control bones, and then you just use a master controller that goes from pay, sorry, from pose A to pose B. That's just it. And we use it to create like those high opening poses, some phonemes or mouth shape. But then we also have like um, controller con controllers for all the bones, all the joints of the face so that we can fine tweak a facial pose if we want to. And this is the kind of like level of control we do have on most of our character. Like we have like those tweaker bone all over the body, so that we can clearly shape them as we want. You can generally do that in um, in cinematic tricks because there are a lot of bones, or you may use like lattices or stuff like that to, to reach like crazy deformation. We just make sure that we can control every joint of our character. And again, since we're using flat hierarchy, I don't care if the game engine will like it or not. That's going to be fine. Though, if you were to do this and keep the hierarchy of your character, you can achieve like super decent results by replacing the stretch to constraint by a damped uh, track constraint. You won't get the, the like the, the big scaling difference, but it does work. So I, I tested it not with Noara's character, but with another character that has a lot of stretch to constraint and stuff like that. Replaced everything with a dumped track, and it worked really well. Like I, I could achieve pretty crazy poses without having like the foot going underground or strange rotation and stuff like that. So we can discuss that later on if you want. Um, finally, we try to plan our animation, which is yeah, generally better, but you know, we're an indie studio, so sometimes ideas uh, come faster than production, and we change a lot of stuff. But we just use as much custom properties as we want, just to, for example, swap the position of uh, an item on the character, or I did knew, I didn't know that I wanted to make this smashing animation, so I rigged the hammer accordingly um, with those extra bones that allow me to, to create those smears, for example. So, hopefully, our flexible rigs and the cartoon influence I may have and, and our philosophy to forget that it's 3D and just make it look good as will a 2D cartoon will, make our animation like a little different or a little better than usual game animation. Um, there are tons of people behind the game, so those are just a part of the artistic team I worked with on the game. But we do have developers, people that manage like everything for sure. Um, a, a super cool CEO that has given me like a lot of freedom in the way I, I in the art directing um, for the game. So that's yeah, super, super cool. And that's it. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So just one last thing. So Game development is a super bumpy road, okay? We've been doing this game for five years, and we are reopening the servers in three weeks, and you should test this newer version of the game. It's the best we ever did. <laughs> so 
like the 18th of November, you will, will be able to play the game. It's a free game, so just yeah, lose like one hour of your life trying our game, and then maybe you, you'll get stick to it. And now who's going to ask the first question? We have like 10 minutes, I think. Yeah, cool. Don't be shy. Okay. So the, the question is, uh, does our face rig are always symmetrical? In most cases, yes. But if I was to work on a monster or whatever, and I, you know the design is not symmetrical, eh, you must fit. So yeah, it's less of a pain when you, have, when you can symmetrize a rig. But beyond facial rig, I mean, even a character with non-symmetrical limbs, that's a pain. People tend to like focus a lot on, on facial ring thinking that it's more complex than limbs or a spine, but that's not necessarily the case. There is a lot of bone on a small surface, but if you can yeah, do just symmetrical design, you concept artists, please. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there is still interpolation, you know? Uh, so we don't, yeah, 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 I, yes, <laughs> I would say. So basically we don't use like, I think our animation data, and it's a bit too techy for me because I don't know, but we don't simplify the curve at export. So I guess our anim animation data is pretty dense. You almost have like a key per frame because everything is baked since all the bones are independent and constrained by the control rig. Um, so then w when you have interpolation within the game, it's in most cases over one frame and over a short distance. So probably if we were to watch it frame by frame, you know, we would spot like some issues, but you can't really like spot them like for real, in real time. So for a uh, tentacle character, I tried. <laughs> uh, I failed. Oh, so it, it depends. So, so that's, I guess, I mean, a, a big problem for a lot of animators where you're teaching something. Uh, you need to use reference, and you don't do it afterward. Uh, sometimes I do. Some, sometimes I don't. Where I do use most of the time reference, it's for creatures. So for example, I animated um, a big, oh, I don't know to say it in English, like stuff on the, the high slant, like, <laughs> like that are super big. You have the seals, thank you. <laughs> it was a sea lion, actually. Uh, watch, watch a sea lion running. That's surprising. That's not like doing this stuff. They are currently running like a dog will do. That's super strange. I feel like super strange. So. Yeah, sometimes it's better to, to watch. So I would say yes and no, it depends. It depends, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, you should, always. <laughs> uh, when I go to the website of playnoir.com, um, everything is uh, in French. Will it be in English? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the, the website, I don't know if they released the latest version, but it's all translated we'll publish a, a video presentation of the game in English with English subtitles and stuff. So yeah, the, the, the froggy part of, the, of Noara will be slowly <laughs> removed in a way. But yeah, the, the game isn't like, I don't know, but it's translated in multiple languages, like in Dutch and maybe in uh, Chinese, I don't remember. So all the translation might not be up to date, but at least the English one should be. Yeah. Huh. We're not paid. <laughs> so uh, fundraising mostly. Uh, so the, uh, I mean, so I, I will give you a quick story about the game. So the CEO is kind of a genius, and he worked on this IP for 18 years. And at some point, he, well, he used to be a pro player on StarCraft Brood War. At the time where being a pro player was having free coffee to the you know, network center, 
and maybe like get a free keyboard from Razer or Asus or whatever. Uh, he's a hardcore gamer, and at some point he was like, yeah, I, I have this idea of an IP, he was writing a book, the first one is already out, by the way, um, probably translated in English, I'm not sure about that. And he was like, let's do a game, and he just sacrificed everything to do that. So I won't go into detail, but that was pretty rough for him. Um, and then he was come like he he was able to convince a lot of people to help us with the game and you know fast found you know, find investors and stuff like that. So all the artists that worked on the, the game were paid, and they were like hopefully correctly paid. At least they were happy to be there. That's I mean the <laughs> a first step. And yeah, yeah, I mean in the direct. Team, team, that's a bit different. We make sacrifices, but that's a cool project. So, and yeah, one 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 thing I was sharing with a lot of people is that I'm able to show you five years of work while the project is now is public. But you know, along the way, I was able to share this. So, as a content creator, that was like already a big salary to be able to use my everyday work for myself in a way for P2 design or for my own fame at the Blender conference. So, yeah, that's cool. Uh, one more, I've seen people build rigs with modular pieces. And um, is there a reason why you're building everything from scratch yourself? Yeah, be because I don't know how to script. <laughs> so I, 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 and I know like, like absolutely, I, I absolutely don't know how. I just sometimes copy part of script and try to, you know, change stuff to have a better UI. But that's about it. So, but yeah, ultimately in my learning path, I would love to be able to kind of create some kind of meta rigs based, based on what I do with Noara. That would be awesome. Yeah, but. I don't know how to. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, I need to. Oh, thank you. We watched your tutorials, and there is a space switching add on. Yeah, yeah. How is it going? So, Tom will not answer, but we have a common friend that is the guy developing it. Um, He's like super busy. So we've been working on, on this tool like for almost two years, uh, like um, intensely. I was hoping it will be released this year, to be honest. At the moment, uh, he hasn't like made like big updates on it. It's, it's a crazy good add-on and I use it a lot. I know that there are some uh, Blender devs here, so I don't know how you could like um, get to be known that has made like more or less um, add-ons that are quite similar, you know, like the rig on the fly add-on, for example. There are other solutions to basically be able to create constraint on the fly, bake the, the motion data of something and change it to world space or whatever. So I don't know. Basically, I don't know. He, he was supposed to be there, he's not there. We are really sad about this. He sent me a message just to root for me and, you know, but yeah, that's, that's life, you know, when you're doing uh, Blender stuff on the side, it's always complicated to, yeah. Any other question? Yeah. So, we saw a lot of bones per character. Is there any limitation in the number of different bones? Uh, I don't know if maybe some, like, more clever people would answer, but I don't know if there's, like, a limitation on the number of bones in Unity. It seems that Unity handles like many bones pretty well. We try to display like 60 characters animating on the same computer with like a shitty laptop, and it was fine. So that will be my answer. You, you can add a lot of bone to a scene and it's fine. Now, when it comes maybe to animation state, you know, where you, you're blending tons of different animation, I don't know if it will work that well. Here is just reading, you know, bone position through time and that's it, he's not trying to, to make crazy stuff with it, so I, I don't really know. And it's on PC, it's not on mobile. On mobile, um, that will be painful for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, one more question about animation. When you bring your animation on Unity, are you do your animation per file or are you doing an array or something? So, uh, yeah. 
not that much. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? <laughs> So, so we, we had a, a conversation with, with Brad regarding this. I need to update my tutorial about exporting characters. So basically, you just create, uh, at least that's for me the best way to do it. You just create uh, a strip in the NRA per action you want to export. And then you don't click all action, but NRA strip. The lower action in the stack will be read as being the default action. So generally, I use a T pose or a rest pose for the character and then you just stack those strips and you source an action. The cool thing about that is that during the exports, the action that will be in Unity or in URFBX will have the name of the strip, not the name of the action. So you could say it's attack one, and it's gonna be attack one in Unity, but you can swap the action into it if you make an update or a modification in Blender. And my workflow is that, maybe it's a shitty workflow, I don't know, I just update the FBX and I just override it in Unity and the meta just update and everything is there. Okay, one last question. Okay, one last question. Yes, no, 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 that's, that's it, I think. Okay, then, oh yeah, one. Uh, in what frame rate do you animate for the game? 30. 30. Yeah, 30 frames per second. And I, I made some cinematic this way. That was a very bad choice. I won't do this anymore. So, yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs>